these proposed marriages are godless. Nobody of Christian feeling or civilized instincts can wish to inflict the sort of insult that would be involved in using Christian churches for no more than acts of sexual vice. Not me saying this, but Lord Hugh Cecil, High Anglican, High Tory, High Camp in 1907. He wasn't talking about same-sex marriage either. That was unthinkable in 1907. He was talking about deceased wife sister marriages, which are banned in the Christian scriptures and which run a coach and horses through the concept of affinity, which the Christian church had taught from the very earliest days of canon law. Ask Henry VIII. Now, if somebody says that the understanding of marriage has never diverged between church and state until now, friends, they're wrong. It's very true to say that same-sex marriage has flared up and arrived in the most extraordinary way. 1.2 billion members of the human race, 31 countries, can now enter same-sex marriages. And I don't just mean civil partnerships, full-blooded marriages. So this is not some wacky project from California. It won't go away. <laughs> but marriage evolves, and marriage has always evolved. In the Bible, you'll find nine different forms of marriage. Uh, none of them, by the way, would be legal in England today, or <laughs> since 1757. My favorite is probably King Solomon who had 700 wives and 300 concubines, with no comment. <laughs> but if that's too much sex, and remember that it said the English have hot water bottles, it's only continentals have sex. <laughs> Consider, please, the medieval mariage blanc, where the whole idea was that nobody had sex. It wasn't a license to have sex, it was a license not to have sex. Look at the prayer book and its understanding of couverture, where the wife becomes the property of the husband, is given away by her father, and the woman may not have property in her own name or a bank account until 1870, that is. 1907, deceased wife sister legislation. That's what made Lord David Cecil have a cow. It ran a coach and horses through affinity, which is a central concept of Christian historic teaching. As late as 1992, marriage was radically redefined in England by um, a court talking about marital rape. Before then, it could not be possible because the consent a woman had given in agreeing to get married was held to be consent for any sexual act her husband might want to do thereafter. Quite extraordinary. And it's as late as 1992 that that uh, sense of what you were committing yourself to in marriage was radically redefined uh, by English courts. What about the church and marriage and the doctrine of the church? Lots of people talk about it, but I wonder if they've actually read it. The doctrine of the church on marriage uh, was first formulated in any modern form between 1922 and 1937 by the Doctrine Commission of the Church of England. And they produced a book called Doctrine in the Church of England. The title is a hint. <laughs> and then they got into the business of banning divorce, which rested on that. The early church had no doctrine of marriage at all in a formal way partly because if you had slaves in your church congregation, they couldn't marry anyway. They were their master's property. So it was not the case that they simply had Betty Crocker marriages in the early church. And that's why you won't find anything about marriage in the creeds. You won't find anything about marriage in the formularies of the early church. It got sucked into marriage in the Middle Ages because of disputes about who was married to who. Well, what does the doctrine of marriage of the Church of England actually say as formulated between 1922 and 1937? Well, here we go. It says there are many forms of marriage in the world, none of which are inherently sacramental. Any particular marriage can only be considered sacramental insofar as it reflects the relationship of the Church to Jesus Christ 
as the bride of Christ. These are the only grounds uh, in which you could see marriage as having anything to do with religion at all in that way. Permanent? Yes. Faithful? Certainly. Self-giving? Yes. But some people say there's special Christian marriage, first class, and that's about being open to the transmission of life, you can have kids, permission to have sex, finally, a difference of gender. Well, now, how do those factors relate to the analogy of Christ and the church, may I ask? Let's run through them. Are we all having sex with Jesus? I don't think so. It'd have to be a pretty extraordinary, I imagine one of those Spanish nuns who used to sleep in her coffin at night or something thinking that. But if that's not where you're coming from, that's a non -so Kids, who are the kids? I don't actually understand that one at all. And if it is a matter of different genders, friends, may I just say that if that is relevant to the relationship of Jesus to the church, Jesus is already in a same-sex marriage to 600 million people. So the things that don't apply to that analogy don't apply to the Bride of Christ analogy anyway. Definitions are not what they're cracked on to be sometimes. And what's often cited as the Christian definition of marriage is in fact a paradigm. Nobody fulfills it perfectly except Jesus and the church. We all fall short and that paradigm remains vibrant and real and claims our loyalty and our vision, but it's not a definition of marriage. So same-sex marriage is here to stay. It won't go away. A huge number of people all over the world have access to it. Considerations of equality and human rights, not having two or three class marriage. You know, you get on the marriage aeroplane and all the gays can go off to the right into cattle class and then all the nice people can go off to the left, um, the register office crowd can go into business class, and the real Christians can go into first class. That's nonsense. Marriage is marriage is marriage, and that's it. What about... We will be told that it compromises religious freedom. What about people who believe sincerely that it's wrong? Well, actually, I know the answer to that. If you believe same-sex marriage is wrong, my friend, please don't marry a homosexual. <laughs> and as long as you manage to do that, I think you'll be okay. Trust me. And what about the Bible? We'll hear more of the Bible. Same-sex marriage sits uncomfortably with nine verses out of 32,000 in the Christian scriptures. The Bible's small print. But what about the Bible's overarching message of love considered as a whole? Either this is a question of small print, and the small print has it, or else as St. John has it in the biggest print of all in the Bible, God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them, gay or straight. I'm proud and delighted to support this motion. <laughs>